Welcome. I'm Colin Duak, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Today we're going to discuss a new book by Dr. Robert Kagan, The Ghost at the Feast. This event is part of the Edward and Helen Hintz Book Forums at AEI. These forums provide a platform to host leading authors for discussion of new books on issues of national interest. We're very grateful to Edward and Helen Hintz for their generous support of AEI and for their deep commitment to its mission. Uh, just a brief introduction, which is probably unnecessary, but Robert Kagan is the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's also a contributing columnist at the Washington Post. He served in the State Department on the policy planning staff under Secretary of State George Shultz. He's the author of several influential books over the years. The latest one, The Ghost at the Feast, America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 to 1941, was released in January by Knopf. Robert, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. So what I'd like to do to start off with is just ask you to give the audience, both here and remotely, a, a brief sense of the core argument of your book. Okay, well, I thank you very much and thanks for having me. It's great to be here at AEI, where all my friends are. Uh, I have friends at Brookings too, but I have a lot of friends here. Um, uh, anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, you, as, as you know, uh, you write a history so that you don't have to do a summary, uh, because the history part of it is the important part, right? It's like what actually happened. But um, I guess what I would say is, uh, this period of American history is where it becomes most apparent what the fundamental paradox of American foreign policy is. And, and basically, it, it, it's this, which is that certainly by 1900, the United States has become invulnerable to, uh, to foreign attack. Uh, it, it, it's inconceivable that any major power would have the capacity to launch an invasion, a successful invasion of the United States uh, across the ocean. The British intelligence at that time uh, said that they could hardly imagine a more hazardous undertaking, and the British were the only ones who could conceivably imagine doing such a thing since they were the only ones who had the Navy to do it. So the United States begins the 20th century in a position of invulnerability, which of course leads many Americans to say, what in the world do we have to care about what's going on in the world? And the United States also at that time is a beneficiary of a fundamentally liberalizing world order which it benefits from, but which it has no role in upholding, which is a wonderful situation. Uh, as, uh, as Bryce said, the, the United States sails on a summer sea. Uh, and, and he was right, and I think many Americans understood that. Uh, what also becomes true almost immediately is what Theodore Roosevelt says in 1900, which is that the United States is the balance of power of the entire globe. And he didn't mean that metaphorically, and as we discovered it, uh, in the course of the first half of the 20th century, it wasn't simply metaphorical. It was, in fact, the case that because of its vast power and its geographical location, the United States had the ability to uh, essentially determine the outcome of any great power conflict um, uh, in the two fundamental regions where these things were occurring, whether it was in, East, whether it was in Asia and the Western Pacific or whether in Europe. Um, and this was a, a fact which I think uh, the other powers repeatedly were not uh, really fully aware of. I think obviously when the Germans planned uh, to conquer the continent of Europe, uh, they didn't even have the United States. It, the Schlieffen Plan doesn't mention the United States. It barely mentions Britain, but it's as if the United States didn't exist. And so, uh, and I would say even Hitler, who had more reason to understand the role of the United States, since he was in the Germany that the United States uh, conquered and determined its next government, uh, nevertheless, by the 1930s, is be becomes once again convinced that the United States is not really going to be an obstacle to his efforts to achieve regional hegemony. Um, and there's a good reason why uh, the, these, part of the reason that these countries, these uh, aspiring regional hegemons keep running into uh, making this mistake is partly because it was a brand new thing historically. The United States was like a new planet that had arrived in the solar system, completely changing uh, all the gravitational pull. Uh, but also because the American people themselves uh, very convincingly uh, in each occasion uh, 
uh, acted and spoke as if they really did not intend to get involved. And it, was, it, it turned out to be a trap that they set for these other powers in a certain way because they sent such strong signals, both in terms of their lack of prepare, physical preparedness for conflict, but also of their psychological uninterest in conflict, again, being willing to lean back on the idea that, um, you know, that we were at the United States was invulnerable and why was it necessary to act, um, only to discover, and I would say, importantly, only for the Americans themselves to discover that they were not actually prepared to tolerate the achievement of regional hegemony in either Europe or Asia by a non-democratic power. And I think it's very important to emphasize the ideological aspect of that. Um, what I would say emerged from this period, and I'll try to end on this note, is if you ask the question, do Americans have a de facto grand strategy toward the world, the answer is yes in terms of their actual behavior. Um, on, numer on three fundamental occasions, and I think we're seeing it again today, an apparently indifferent America nevertheless rose to the, to, to the challenge of maintaining uh, a balance against an autocratic regional hegemon uh, in two regions, was willing to expend enormous resources, including lives, to prevent that from happening. And so, uh, as it turns out, regardless of the paradoxical nature of the American position uh, and, and the fact that many Americans don't even would never articulate such a grand strategy. In fact, if you actually articulate such a grand strategy, you're generally attacked in the United States. But in terms of de facto behavior of the United States, it's very clear that uh, American foreign policy has been driven in the world not by narrow considerations of American security, which was not even threatened before World War II, but rather by concerns about the success and continuing durability of what I've taken to calling the liberal hegemony. Uh, not li there, it's not a w the misunderstanding of Wilsonianism, which says America has to spread democracy everywhere in the world. That has never been American policy, including it was not Wilson's policy, but to defend and preserve the existing uh, liberal world order at whatever basis that has been at over the course of the century has been an enduring American goal. And, and I'll just end by saying, if you look at our, the American response to Ukraine, um, I don't think anybody who's in the international relations field uh, would have said before February of last year that, uh, that the United States had a vital interest in the independence of Ukraine. After all, the United States had lived without an independent Ukraine for decades and decades and decades without it having the least effect on our security. Uh, nevertheless, the American response, uh, which has obviously become problematic to some extent for reasons we can get into, but the American response indicates a still uh, powerful impulse uh, to want to prevent uh, a, another autocratic great power from expanding its reach and seeking uh, hegemony in its region. And so this cycle that we have seen the United States go through, certainly throughout the course of the 20th century, which is really a pattern of oscillation between periods of high engagement and high intervention followed by uh, retrenchment and disillusionment followed by engagement, et cetera, uh, this oscillation is a direct product, I would argue, of the paradoxical circumstances that we that the United States happens to live in. Very good. So I'm going to, uh, I'll say for starters, I thought it was a good read, very engaging. My copy's all marked up, which is always a good sign. Um, and I had a few questions just to sort of walk through some of the cases. Um, you tell a good story, and the book is mercifully free of, of IR theory. I'm saying this as a political scientist, so there's not too many isms, which I like. Um, so you narrate this, this amazing story of America's rise to world power. And you point out that at the very beginning, even before World War I, there was this surprisingly popular uh, arbitration movement across party lines, uh, especially elite, but it was, it was popular. The idea being that the US could actually take a world leading role without being a major military power by sort of promoting international law, arbitration treaties, and so on. And every president, several in a row, 
including TR, Teddy Roosevelt actually did this. Um, so those are the internationalists, and even somebody like a William Jennings Bryan was a big fan of this sort of thing. On the other hand, the, my question is this. There is a certain type of internationalist like Teddy Roosevelt who at the same time is pretty hard-nosed about US interests, the need for hard power, the need for a big navy, you know, sort of forward-leaning. I mean, that's not a William Jennings Bryan approach. The it seems to me the differences between those two types of internationalists is very significant. It, but I wonder if you're, at the beginning, you seem to sort of downplay those differences and say there's internationalists, and then there's, you know, the, the older American tradition. Yeah, and, and it's a very good question, and, and it's hard really to parse. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of historians and uh, uh, international relations people looking at history trying to do, separate the different kinds of internationalists. So they usually refer to uh, Roosevelt and your friend Lodge as conservative internationalists and people like Brian and Wilson as, I don't know what, you know, woolly-headed idealistic uh, internationalists. And I think that it, it's, those, those distinctions are not as clear as the historians and, and I, our theorists, have suggested. After all, Although it was certainly the case that if you Brian was probably you know a, on the on the on the pacifist side uh, of the spectrum, he certainly had no difficulty using force uh, when he was in power. Uh, he he certainly was in favor of, of interventions in Latin America uh, under his term, and he was. Uh, ultimately a very enthusiastic, uh, ultimately, you know, he opposed our entry into World War I, but then, uh, you know, in the same period that everybody else flipped on World War I in 1917, he flipped too. And so I, I, I don't want to go too far. Plus, in, a, in addition to which, I don't accept the notion that Wilson doesn't understand the importance of power. I think Wilson very much understood the importance of power. Um, and I basically see Roosevelt and Wilson as being two peas uh, in the same pod until uh, the, uh, the war ends and then they, they, they have, I think, mostly driven by politics, different places. But, but get, let's just get to your core point, which is I think all Americans, including Lodge, if you would ask them what their preference was in, at the turn of the century, it would be to be, and I'm quoting Lodge here, uh, a great power of a different sort, um, by which he meant a, a power that would have the ability to shape international affairs and, and settle uh, disputes between other powers, because the general view of, of Roosevelt and Lodge was that the status quo was good, any war w that, the, that the world got into was gonna be bad, and therefore the United States should do that, and that this was the special mission of America, which was to be the power, because the United States had a reputation, correctly, of being fairly disinterested in most of the battles that the rest of the world was having. The United States didn't really have a horse in the African, you know, in dividing up Africa, or really even in dividing up Asia, and certainly in how Europe was settled. So uh, they were sort of indifferent to the outcome, which they felt made them the perfect intermediary. And by the way, other countries did treat the United States as if it were the perfect intermediary. The Japanese and the Russians both happily, the Japanese more happily, but the Russians also accepted American mediation. The French and the Germans accepted American mediation over the Moroccan crisis. So to some extent that was true. Um, but ultimately World War I kind of blows up that fantasy. And then I would say most internationalists at that point become power internationalists, not just uh, you know, uh, uh, institution creating and national, uh, internationalist. Maybe, maybe you see it differently. I know that you are a big student of this period. Well, I've been outed as a friend of Henry Cabot Lodge. <laughs> I didn't say you were a friend, but if you want to, if you no, want to condemn I, I, yourself in that way, that's uh, <laughs> that's fine. The uh, I've been rummaging around in his papers, writing a biography <laughs> for all of you who uh, are curious. So um, I think it's true that Wilson had a very keen sense of power, actually, both, both at home and abroad. I don't think he had a particularly keen sense for the fact that other countries would want to pursue their own interests regardless of what the US said. I don't think that's true either, but we can, we can have an argument okay. about that. OK, all right. Well, so I have to ask one large question. So Wilson had a, had a habit of assuming that people who opposed his vision were either wicked or stupid. <laughs> 
He couldn't say that Lodge was stupid. He obviously wasn't. So therefore, he had to be wicked. So the Wilsonian interpretation of Lodge was it's just purely political. He doesn't really believe this. He can't honestly oppose the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles, which is obviously a good thing for us and for the world. Um, so, and, and you do seem to accept the kind of Wilsonian interpretation of Lodge, which is it's mainly political. Uh, at the critical moment when politics was the more important thing for Lodge, uh, and that was the case certainly uh, from the 1918 congressional elections on. Uh, at that point, the number one objective, and after all, Lodge was a Republican first and a foreign policy guy second, third, or fourth. Uh, he was the leader of his party effectively under Wilson, um, and the, the fact that Wilson was in office was not only the most horrific affront to Republican sensibilities because the Republicans had dominated. This is still a civil war. We're still looking at the world in a civil war context. And from the Republican point of view, the Democrats were evil and Republicans were good uh, because they were the ones who fought for morality. And the number of times that both Lodge and Roosevelt call Wilson Buchanan uh, which was the worst thing you could possibly say about something, gives you, gives you that in a sense. So the number one objective of Republicans um, uh, was to make sure that the, uh, a Democrat did not win in 1920. Wilson was flirting with a third term, et cetera. And by the way, no one felt this more keenly than Roosevelt, who was personally responsible for the fact that Wilson was in office, and he knew it. And it was especially because of what he did in 1912. He gave the election to Wilson. He gave the Democrats the White House uh, with his own egotistical selfishness. And so, and he was aware of that. So the, the desire to beat Wilson was overwhelming. So yes, when it came to the League of Nations debate, I think Wilson was absolutely right. And by the way, it wasn't just Wilson who felt, forget about wicked, this is politics, but it wasn't just w Wilson who felt that Lodge was engaging in a purely political uh, efforts to defeat the League in order to defeat Wilson, in order to defeat the Democrats, so did his Republican colleagues. So I, I don't think there's any question. I don't think it's, I don't think it's unusual. I, I don't know how we can live in our current time and not think and understand that sometimes politicians use foreign policy for political domestic reasons that have nothing to do with their actual views. Lodge's record Lodge talked about the League of Nations before Wilson did. Lodge was on the League to Enforce Peace, and, and at the famous meeting where Wilson finally came and said, I'm interested in perhaps having a League of Nations, Lodge was on the dais next to him. And um, in fact, the idea of a League in its most developed form was originally proposed by Roosevelt in 1914, right after the war began. He laid out in a series of essays a whole discussion of what was effectively a League of Nations. Um, ironically, by the way, with a much more legalistic bent because he actually had an international court that the League was somehow, that this League was gonna be related to. So uh, for them to turn around and defeat the League, I think, it, it has to be politics. I, it, I've never heard a convincing foreign policy explanation. I know that then, we decide to turn Lodge into a quasi-isolationist who thinks that the only thing that matters is the Western Hemisphere. That's the sort of purport of Widener's book. Uh, but I think that just puts, you know, he definitely behaved and spoke differently uh, before that political confrontation. And I think it's true that, there, that politics is always a huge factor and that Republicans were tilting by 1920 more and more toward just saying, we need to build, beat Wilson regardless. My reading of Lodge in kind of 1918-19 is that in his letters in private, I mean, he's really concerned about the League. He thinks Article 10 is a terrible idea because it's promising to defend every country on Earth, and he doesn't think Wilson really means it. And Wilson was actually pretty slippery on this. He never really was willing to say yes or no. It was this very sweeping commitment. I mean, it wasn't, isn't there any legitimate room for debate over this? I mean, he, Wilson could have pulled the rug out from under his critics by just giving them the reservations, right? Oh, no, come on. You obviously have not read the book. I mean, he, <laughs> I, I read your book. I, yeah. I go into this in such detail. Yeah. I mean, it, I, and I really feel like it, it, it's, it's so clear when you go through uh, Lodge's behavior uh, that, that it is ultimately political. And 
the Article 10 controversy was a total fabrication. Article 10 committed the United States to nothing. That was its point, in a way. Article 10 was an attempt to bridge an impossible situation, which was, on the one hand, Wilson, who, by the way, was extremely conscious of the other great powers' interests at, Vers at, uh, at Paris uh, and, and in fashioning the Versailles Treaty. And one thing he knew for sure was that the French were absolutely petrified about their security situation and did not and, and wanted to tie the United States in as closely as possible to a real bilateral military alliance or a trilateral alliance if it included the British uh, that would protect them in the event, in, the, in, in what they regarded as the inevitable return of German power. And Wilson wanted to give them that guarantee as a means of not f allowing them, which was their goal, to break up Germany entirely. Now, we can, re we can debate whether it would have been good to divide Germany uh, in 1918 as opposed to in 1945, but nevertheless, they didn't think so at the time. And so in order, but they wanted to give the French something and, and what they gave them was Article 10. Article 10, first of all, called on nations to, uh, it, it, there had to be a council that would agree on the action, and everybody knew that whatever that council agreed, it would then have to come back to the United States and pass, and you know, that the Senate would still have its power to declare war. And the people who or, organized Article 3, like David Hunter Miller, who was the lawyer present, he always said it was absurd to think that Article 10 was binding. And the French hated Article 10. They, they didn't think Article 10 meant anything. And so uh, I think that, uh, that in, in classic fashion, yes, Lodge did make the case that this was going to uh, uh, require the United States to go fight the, a war anywhere in the world. Uh, but that was absurd. And I don't know what he said in his letter. I mean, people write what they... Even when people are propagandizing, they generally internalize their own propaganda and write about it. But um, I think that his, will, his reading of Article 10 was willfully uh, exaggerated. Well, I did read your book. I just didn't agree with that part of it. Okay. So. Well, there you go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So you moving... gave me a chance to talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> moving to the 1920s, I think this is an interesting decade because somebody like Herbert Hoover, who's a key figure even before he becomes president, is very idealistic. I mean, he really believes you can Americanize the whole international system without any kind of military strategic commitment in the old world. I mean, they're not, it's not a sort of narrow or, or real politique view. It's actually quite sweeping and, and almost naive. And then, of course, it collapses by the early 30s. I, I, again, Hoover, we know what Hoover looked like before the big shift in the Republican Party. When the Republican Party was still the internationalist party, Hoover was at the forefront of Republican internationalism. And of course, his activities were all about being involved overseas and uh, helping with food in Belgium and Russia, et cetera. Um, I, I didn't, never saw an indication that he was averse to the use of force. He was totally in favor of American entry uh, into World War I. What happened to Hoover was that after the defeat of the League and after the defeat of Wilson, and really, in my view, after the defeat of Lodge, because I think one of the things that Lodge accomplished in the, co in the course of defeating the League and defeating Wilson was he basically turned the party over to William Bora. Uh, it was Bora calling the shots on who was going to be Secretary of State uh, in the Harding administration in 1920, Bora and Brandegui and the others. Um, and the people that they suspected most and were very unhappy to see in the new administration included, on the one hand, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, who they thought was too much of an internationalist, but also very much Herbert Hoover. So Herbert Hoover is now spending the next decade trying to get out from under this Republican hostility, and he does so by adopting Republican views. Shockingly, the man wants to be president of the Republican Party. By the time he's president, he sounds like a Republican, um, uh, and, and a Republican of the Bora uh, variety. So what you see in Hoover, and then, and then yes, what you see in Hoover is an attempt, given America's fundamental isolationist position, is how do you somehow uh, you know, organize a peace without any American power? And that's how you get into things, which was not on his watch. I believe the Kellogg-Briand Pact was on the previous administration's watch. But it was emblematic of that kind of approach. Meaningless 
uh, international agreements that specifically required nothing from the United States. That was Hoover's goal. It obviously failed. It failed most spectacularly in Manchuria. Um, and I, I, you know, if it had, if he'd still, well, and Roosevelt basically continued his policy for the next, uh, for the, his first term. So I would say that approach continued to fail uh, until the United States reversed course and basically repudiated its uh, isolationist internationalist approach. And you do a good job tracing FDR's leadership during those crucial years. So if the first great debate is kind of World War I, the second is World War II, and FDR, unlike Wilson, I think, is much savvier politically about how to handle this. And it's very impressive. Can you go into a little more detail about how exactly FDR kind of nudges the US into this informal alliance with Britain? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting story. And of course, you know, he begins uh, quite unsuccessfully. Uh, you know, his first great comment in, in the, you know, he, he feels this concern about what's happening in Europe uh, all the way through, certainly by the time uh, of, uh, you know, the Italian intervention in Ethiopia uh, and certainly after the, after the Rhineland. But, but he feels that his hands are completely tied by the general isolationist uh, bipartisan consensus at that point in the United States. His first attempt to try to rouse the country is in his 1937 uh, quarantine speech in which he refers to the unnamed three bandit nations. Uh, and the, the response to that, uh, he feels in any case, is so negative uh, that he, uh, he feels it forced to to, you know, to, to back away from it. People ask him what he meant by it, and he almost literally says, I didn't mean anything by it. Um, uh, but, but then I think, you know, in his way, I think because we knew, you know, we, I think we know which way he was leaning, it's possible to go back and say that he waited for an event. I mean, his response to Munich is sort of, is sort of incomprehensible. On the one hand, he's sort of encouraging Chamberlain to do it. On the other hand, he's calling him Judas Iscariot behind his back, um, you know. And so I think, but part of his problem, again, is his hands are tied. But he uses, as we all know, he uses the events as they occur as a way of continually strengthening his argument. It, to me, what's interesting about FDR's argument is that although he, I would say, borderline dishonestly is constantly threatening about a possible German attack directly on the United States, which I really don't see much prospect of, even if they got Brazil, which, as people reminded, might remind us, is farther from the United States than, than certain parts of Europe. But um, in any case, but, but I think the essence of his argument, which he gave on, uh, in several speeches, was we don't want to live in a world, we may be okay, but we don't want to live in a world that's dominated by tyrants on either side. And I think gradually uh, that argument, and of course events, events help to, uh, to bring him along. The one thing I do want to say, because you, you referred to it, is that you know, FDR gets a lot of credit for being more savvy, and Wilson is, is treated like he's a political idiot. The only thing I want to make, uh, it's worth remembering, is that Roosevelt enjoyed majorities in Congress that were unheard of. I mean, he had a House majority that was something in the order of 360 to 50 at various times. He had dominance in the Senate that was in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so you didn't have to be quite so clever when you were in such complete control. And what that meant was that rather than Wilson's situation where he had no control over the legislative calendar because Lodge did, Lodge was able to bring the treaty up when he wanted to, he was able to bring the amendments up that he wanted to make, he, could fat, he controlled the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and put the, the, the people who were opposed to the league on it, etc. None of that was available to Republicans in opposition uh, against FDR. They couldn't even, the I, Republican isolationists couldn't even nominate their own guy in 1940. They nominated Wendell Wilkie, who was an internationalist. So I think it's a lit, it was a much easier task for FDR. Uh, and Wilson is, 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 is maligned by comparison to FDR, but I think, and of course, FDR was probably the greatest political genius in American history, but he also had an enormous, and on foreign policy, 
critically important advantage, which was complete control of Congress. So there is, I have one last question, then we'll turn to the audience. But there is this kind of theme of liberal world order throughout the book, the, the sense that there was this missed opportunity you know, right after World War I, and then it was finally seized in the 40s. Um, and of course, the British previously had been the leader of this relatively open commercial and financial order. But uh, the phrase comes up a lot, liberal world order. People sort of either like it or they don't. But I wonder, you know, getting back to sort of abstractions, if you look at, for example, the British in the 1800s, I mean, you point out that on the continent of Europe, you know, the, it was a balance of power that actually made this work. The, I think Bismarck said he, if the British army landed, he'd arrest them or something like that. So they, they didn't really have the ability to order European states around on the continent. So, you know, is it possible to overstate to what extent there was ever such an order? Is it more, here we have nation states pursuing their own interests in Europe and around the world, and either that's in the American interest or it isn't. Um, why sort of fix on this concept? Well, a, a liberal world order, as you suggest, is such a fraught phrase that I, I, you know, I don't think I use liberal world order. I think I use world order and I use liberal order. And I, you know, because liberal world order implies, first of all, a totality of the world. It implies, I, I object to the rules based order because mm. not everybody follows the rules, including us. Um, and, and, but, but what I'm talking about, rightly or wrongly, um, is what Walter Lippmann uh, before World War I and after World War I referred to, uh, he referred to it as the Atlantic community, by which he basically meant the democracies on both literals on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, that was a world that, as you say, was uh, open for commerce, uh, was open for people, was open for communications, uh, the countries involved in that order uh, were fundamentally liberal themselves in their approach, and the opponent were the opponents of that were anti-liberal. They they weren't just not part of the liberal order. Germany in World War One, the, the so-called spirit of 1914 is, and 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 this is something again that I go into a lot in the book. The Germans were explicitly anti-liberal. One of the things they were fighting was liberalism. And so, you know, we unfortunately, and I do blame IR theorists, but historians have also done this, they've drained World War I of the ideological content that was critical to everyone at the time. Both sides thought they were fighting an ideological conflict, in addition to being a geopolitical conflict. And so, uh, I think that is in, it's in that context that I would that I refer to the liberal world. It was the world that shared liberal values, and I think Americans demonstrated again that it was not just, for instance, if you're a realist, you say Americans oppose any hegemony uh, in Europe. Uh, I don't think they opposed any hegemony. I think they would have been perfectly happy with British hegemony. In fact, Roosevelt himself didn't, he sort of criticized Wilson's naval buildup because he thought there was nothing wrong with the British having the most powerful navy in the world. It worked fine for us. What was the problem? I don't know how serious he was about that. He made that point. But we were perfectly, I think Americans were perfectly happy with it, with British dominance, but they were unwilling to accept uh, the consequences of German dominance. There were so many reasons why we went into the war, obviously, but I do believe that this fundamental ideological conflict was part of it, which is why I talk about defending the liberal world. And I think it's been true ever since. The liberal world's much larger now, uh, but it is still confined. It is not the world. It is still those who share liberal values. That's basically, uh, that's basically the, the, what makes that world. Uh, and insofar as it's a stable liberal world, then you can talk about a liberal world order. So let's move to some questions from the audience. And, and uh, is there a mic to pass around? Corey, I'm going to give you the first crack at it. Uh, so where does the Washington Naval Conference in 1923 fit into this story? Because it seems to connect that the two interests intellectually that you guys represent. On the one hand, it does seem to me that what Wilson was trying to do at the end of World War I, Harding to some extent picks up and does with the interlocking treaties that, uh, negotiated at Washington in 1923. 
And Cabot Lodge takes a very different approach to those treaties than he did to Versailles. So where does it fit in your story? Um, and Colin, can you explain Lodge in this context? Which do you want first? Oh, OK. <laughs> so I, you're right about what Harding's initial instinct was. And by the way, the big question that Harding faced very early on was whether to continue Wilson's naval buildup. Because Wilson had ordered a, 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 the largest naval buildup in American history at that point, which, if fulfilled, uh, would have given the United States by far the strongest navy in the world. And in particular, a navy that, as the Japanese uh, naval commander himself said, would turn the Pacific into an American lake. It, it was such a force that, uh, that the Japanese who were attempting to build, they, they almost were ready to give up in the faith. They knew they could not compete with the United States if the United States was to continue this naval battle. Unfortunately for Harding, the congressional opposition to the continuing naval buildup was overwhelming. And so, much to his own chagrin, and again, facing Bora, who was in foreign policy still the effective leader of the party, he was forced to scrap uh, uh, the naval, and, and they decided to make a virtue of scrapping all this by having a treaty in which they hoped they could also somehow constrain everybody else. And so one aspect, as you know, of the, of the Naval Treaty is the, is the setting of the 553, uh, one and a half, one and a half limits on everybody's naval construction. But the other part of it was a classic 1920s, I'll even say Republican treaty with no teeth. Uh, the Washington Naval Treaties, in theory, said all kinds of great things about China's sovereignty and all working cooperatively, and you know uh, that was the Nine Power Treaty, um, and then there was a Five Power Treaty. But the wonderful thing about all these treaties, and it was literally the thing that allowed them to pass, was the fact that they required zero commitment from the United States, zero. And so, in fact, as the Japan, as when the Chinese Revolution uh, starts going, you know, when China starts breaking up in the 1920s, the Japanese, who were in a very pro-liberal mode right then, because they thought the future was America, and so they were, they, they were accommodating to that future, turned to the United States and said, okay, Washington Naval, Washington Treaties, let's get to work together on all this stuff. And the Americans were like, are you kidding? What do they do with that stuff? So, and at that point, the Japanese said, okay, then we'll do it ourselves. Um, and we saw the consequences of that. So, um, I would say the Washington Naval Treaties are the, the Washington Treaties are the beginning of this hollow internationalism uh, that is such a disaster ultimately. Because on the one hand, it's theoretically reassuring; it, it helps Americans do what they want to do, which is pay no attention whatsoever on the grounds that somehow it's being taken care of. Um, and so, uh, so that and that and what's different, obviously, and why Lodge. I'm going to jump into your answer before you get to it, <laughs> was that it was precisely the lack of commitment that it made it acceptable to Lodge because there's no Article 10 in the Washington Naval Treaty or anything resembling even a suggestion that the United States might have to get involved. Yeah, in that case, I think Lodge actually is trying to be a good party man uh, in the way that uh, Bob suggests. So he's, he's, in the, he's basically trying to make things work on behalf of the Harding administration. And there are complicated politics internally. You've got kind of Western populists. And um, this treaty is very popular. The treaty doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's popular. So in that, I think throughout his career, Lodge tended to support a big navy. I mean, he, to a fault, right? But earlier, let's keep in mind, earlier the US had not built to the point where it was able to match Great Britain. So I suppose a generous interpretation would be once you're matching Great Britain, you can let it slide. But I think in that case, it's, there's a lot of politics going on. J.P. Hogan, um, first of all, I, see, I don't see Al Smith in your index, so I'm wondering if you're going to talk about the difference between Teddy and FDR, or how much you, Al Smith in New York and the rise of FDR. But to, talking uh, back to the lodge in that era, our republic is basically for frontier pilgrims where they're, they're under their god before under their government. So where would the constitutional right to have uh, bound citizens to, a, um, to something greater? 
where if they are supposed to live as the Republic is under their God before under their government as the essence of religious freedom, is, is that where the, uh, the viability of these articles were breaking down? Yeah, I mean, look, the case, whatever, whatever, however you want to phrase it, the, the, the case had to do with American sovereignty and, of, and, the, and the sovereign right of the United States to make its own decisions about whether to go to war or not to go to war, and, and, and Article 10 did not prevent them from doing that. So it, that, it, it, was, it was an argument that, um, that somehow this was taking Congress's power away, but it wasn't taking Congress's power away. So... Uh, again, because the United States, even under Article 10, could decide what it wanted to do, and the only way it was going to make that decision was by its own internal processes. There was no overriding of the internal process. There's a uh, question online that I think is worth asking. It's from Jackson Lopez. How do the features of the American-led liberal world order different fr differ from the British system in terms of the United States' requi requisite commitments and potential resilience? Well, I want to hear the second half of that in a second. But I mean, the, the most obvious way it differed is I don't think the British were trying to establish a liberal world order. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just, they had, their grand strategy was to have the largest navy in the world primarily for defensive purposes, but also, and perhaps equally, for the maintenance of an empire on which their all their wealth uh, ultimately depended. They were a small, not particularly large island that nevertheless was wielding way outsized influence in the world, and the reason was because of their, their navy. Uh, but I, they were not, despite various claims to the contrary, attempting to defend liberalism around the world. Uh, in fact, they were much more concerned in an early period about defending Protestantism around the world, as you, as you have <laughs> pointed out in your article. But um, whereas I think for the Americans, it's clear that uh, there's a real gap between what you might call uh, the, the, the sort of narrow material interests of the United States. Economically, the United States was not nearly dependent on foreign trade. Uh, at the turn of the century as the British were. I think something I less than 5% of America's GDP was, was about trade. Um, but it, and therefore, it was more ideological. It was more, in fact, about preserving, they would say, democracy, but what we really mean is liberalism uh, in places where it was threatened. I think the British were more... Uh, were less ideological in that way. And again, because England ultimately is a country that precedes liberalism, whereas America is not really a country that precedes, I mean, it had its uh, anti-liberal uh, segment, <laughs> half of it, for its first half of the 19th century, but in terms of its founding documents, it doesn't precede liberalism, it is liberalism. And I think that is in part, that in part explains the, uh, the reason why Americans seem to be interested in liberalism uh, surviving in the world. <clears throat> Other questions, there were a few in the back um, over here. Hi, uh, Ian Everhart. The uh, conventional wisdom is that Franklin Roosevelt was one of the greatest presidents, and I suspect it's because he led the United States to victory um, in the Second World War. But until the Japanese and then the Germans both unilaterally provoked the United States and, it, uh, and declared war in uh, December 1941, you know, Germany came pretty close to actually winning in the summer of 1940 against Britain and then the summer and fall of 1941 against the Soviets. And I, I, I recognize that he took some measures to help uh, both belligerents. Um, do you accept the, the narrative that, you know, isolationism was this overwhelmingly powerful domestic force tying his hands? Or um, do you think he could have done more before uh, Pearl Harbor? Thank you. Thank uh, if, if you don't mind, can I take issue with the first thing you said, which is that they provoked us by attacking Pearl Harbor and declaring war on us. I mean, that is certainly not their perspective. And I think it's fair to say that is not a balanced uh, appreciation of what happened, which was, from their point of view, we provoked both conflict, both aspects of that conflict. Um, we could have minded our own business and let them do what they wanted on their continents. Um, and the fact that we didn't put us in the crosshairs. So there, so there was that. And by the way, that is what, Wills, what Roosevelt did. 
he took steps uh, that almost guaranteed that Hitler would have... Hitler was not interested in a war with the United States at the time. Uh, what he wanted was a Japanese-American war, but he personally was not. But, but the way it wrote, from, from Hitler's point of view, the United States was practically already in the war by the time, by the time he declared war. And, so, and as far as the Japanese, they would never have attacked the United States if we hadn't done the things that we did to try to prevent them. So, so there's that. Could Roosevelt have done things any earlier? You know, everybody is always, you know, if you're Henry Stimson, the answer is yes. Um, it, it, you know, but I think most people would say, and Roosevelt certainly would say, he did his best, but the country was really, you know, every time he, you know, when he gave the quarantine speech, Republicans in Congress uh, wanted to impeach him. Now, I know we've gotten really used to the idea that people should be impeached for doing whatever, but uh, some people, and... Uh, but in that case, it was kind of unusual to think about impeaching a president over a foreign policy speech. Um, so he really did face um, some real... And, and then finally, what, the, what he provided Britain and, and, and the Soviets was critical to their outcome. It, it, the Soviets could not... And by the way, Stalin freely admitted this. Uh, he could not, they could not possibly have held out against the Germans without the vast amounts, mostly of American vehicles... Uh, but, but also support, and, and there's no question. I think the British could have withstood, uh, they, they, could, they won the Battle of Britain without the United States, but if the United States had never uh, b begun to you know, help Britain, I don't, I don't think there's any reason to think. They would have, what they would have done was sued for peace. I mean, I think that, that was the likeliest outcome, but because of the United States being in the background, they didn't do that. So I, I do think what FDR did was critical, and I don't get into the, you know, was he a wonderful president? You know, there, there, say, there were so many things going on. Who knows what was good and what was bad? But on this issue, I would say he probably did as well as could be done. Other questions? Hi. Um, so it seems to me that uh, there are different ways of looking at American foreign policy. There's obviously the split, split between um, Wilsonians, Jacksonians, Hamiltonians, Jeffersonians. And it seems to me that since 2016, there kind of developed a critique, at least in the Republican Party, of kind of the rise of the Jacksonians as opposed to the Wilsonians. And it seems to me that what you're trying to do in your book is kind of re-articulate Wilsonianism and maybe argue that Wilsoni Wilson wasn't so much of a Wilsonian in that kind of woolly-headed foreign policy internationalist way as the right is starting to critique him as being. Um, so to kind of like go back into history and you know, re remake that paradigm of looking at American foreign policy. Um, because it seems to me that people on the right certainly look at 21st century American foreign policy, whether uh, Obama's foreign policy or Bush's foreign policy, and kind of look back and see it as being too Wilsonian as opposed to any of these different types of um, schools of thought. So I was just wondering what your comments would be as to kind of this, you know, Wilsonianism that people are speaking of today and how it's actually more complicated than people are making out to be. Yeah, I don't believe in Wilsonianism. I don't believe in Jacksonianism. I don't believe in, what's the other one? Hamiltonianism. And what was the other one? Jeffersonianism. Yeah, I don't believe in any of those divisions. I think that's a, I mean, I love Walter, and he's a very clever guy, and he's written some great stuff, but I think that is a, a I don't even know why Andrew Jackson is blamed for being a Jacksonian. <laughs> As president, he did nothing that was aggressive. In fact, he mostly spent most of his time trying to cut trade deals with everybody. That was Andrew Jackson's foreign policy. So what is it, like Indian killing? So we have a policy of Indian killing? Is that our, is that our foreign policy? I never understood that, really. But yes, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is not to reframe Wilsonianism, but to get rid of Wilsonianism. Because I don't think that that is the way our foreign policy has been divided. Um, I think there is such a thing uh, as a conservative American foreign policy, which tends toward its conservative... It tends toward isolationism, largely because it's a small government, because of small government. It was a total aberration in the Cold War, uh, and particularly in the Reagan years, that somehow conservative foreign policy got identified with a global internationalist foreign policy. That's a, that's a freak. That is a liberal foreign policy. That is the classic liberal American foreign policy. And, and, it's, and mostly America is liberal. There are times when America is very much in that conservative mode, the 1920s being one of them. You know, if you think about what's happening domestically in the 1920s, you've got incredible 
uh, white supremacy, you've got, you know, the Klan is running wild, you've got protectionism, xenophobia, etc. That foreign policy is the other side of that domestic coin. Um, and I think that happens over and over again. You know, Roosevelt, in the context of foreign policy, is a liberal. You know, he's a liberal because he believes in supporting uh, liberalism, uh, you know, where it's threatened. As, and in that respect, he's the same as Wilson. So I think, you know, the problem is, is that historians are intellectuals, and intellectuals like the idea of intellectual fights. But I, I think these were mostly... They were mostly political fights. I don't think there was a great argument over theories of American foreign policy and all this. And I don't think it's helpful to talk in terms of Jacksonian or not Jacksonian. One of the most aggressive uh, periods of American foreign policy was when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State. And he wanted to take every inch of what the Spanish had on the continent. And he was the one, by the way, who sent Andrew Jackson to go do the fighting. So is, is John Quincy Adams a Jacksonian? I mean, you know, he's a Boston Brahmin. Uh, so uh, Harry Truman was a Jacksonian, but he followed policies that are almost indistinguishable from FDR. Was FDR a Jacksonian? You know, I, I, just, don't, I just don't find these categories very useful. Well, just to pick up on that, I mean, to put it bluntly, why should conservatives in America support liberal world order? No, if they're opposed to liberalism, which I think many of them are, they're opposed to liberalism here. And I don't mean liberalism like those liberals. I mean American, the founding document. They're opposed to the principles of the Declaration of Independence. They are actually opposed to it. Um, I can certainly point to people on the most extreme end. Patrick Deneen is opposed to it. Um, and so, and I think there's a spectrum of conservatives uh, who go from what I would call liberal conservatism, which is the conservatism that preserves liberalism, to anti-liberal conservatism, which is, the lib which is the conservatism that is opposed to liberalism, which is what we have now. And um, so yeah, they, there's no reason for them to be uh, supportive of liberalism overseas, and I don't think it's an accident that people like Trump and company, as they look out at the world, want to be friends with non-liberal countries and non-liberal movements. They favor every anti-liberal movement in Europe, uh, in a, never mind uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, so I think that is, a, and, and, and by the way, before World War II, uh, <laughs> conservative Republicans were, let's say, soft on Hitler, soft on Germany. They saw Germany as a bulwark against communism. Um, and they were not so sure they disagreed with the, the policies toward Jews either, uh, in many of them. So, including George Kennan, by the way. Um, whereas the supporters of intervention against Germany tended to be Roosevelt New Deal liberals. There's a famous book uh, by one of the critics of, of our involvement in World War II called The New Dealer's War. And so you had, you know, liberals as they looked out at the world thought that the fascism, which they feared at home, so they feared fascism governments at home, and so their buddy was the Soviet Union, so they were soft on the Soviets. You know, I mean, this is, there is no escaping the fact that for Americans in particular, I think partly because foreign policy is so optional, but as you point out, it's also true in Britain, that your views about the domestic ideological debate determine your views of foreign policy more than the other way around. But There's very few people who care about foreign policy first. I mean, I'm struck how when you talk about those who opposed U.S. intervention overseas, and in some important cases, I, have, I happen to think they were wrong, <laughs> 1940 being an obvious example. But, you know, it's not like Robert Taft was sitting around saying, I love Hitler. I mean, he, he was a, what we would call a libertarian. He was worried about the growth of government inside the U.S. Are you willing to admit that these critics, I mean, have honest differences of opinion with internationalists? Because it, it, from what I'm hearing, in every case, it's like either they're Klansmen or they hate the American founding or... You know, it's some. It's well, I am taking their ideas seriously. I mean, that that that's the point. I I yes, I think there is a disagreement, but we want to have a disagreement that's just a foreign policy disagreement that doesn't involve the underlying sources of that foreign policy disagreement. And I think that that's that would be inaccurate. Robert Taft, uh, whether he was sought, whether he was you know pro Hitler or not, I'm not saying he was pro Hitler, but everything about his orientation. Look, they were saying that FDR was a communist, that he was advised by communists, that the government, that he was leading America toward communism. Uh, 
And that, is, that was the, that, it wasn't just about small government or not small government, it was the threat of socialism and communism they were warning about. And so as they looked out at the world, the big threat in the world was communism. I, I, I just think that there's no getting around that. Now, by the way, in terms of taking their objections seriously, I think one of the things that I do in the book, I certainly try to do, is make the case that the anti-entrenchments were right when they said that the United States did not have to enter this conflict and still be able to maintain its security. Now, they were discredited by Pearl Harbor because they had promised that the United States couldn't be attacked. They, Pearl Harbor didn't really prove them wrong. Japan was not about to invade the United States, uh, but, but it, it discredited them. But the fact was they were right in saying we did not have to do this. And that is, I think, a big corrective to the assumption that they were just idiots. I don't think they were idiots. I, what I'm trying to uh, get into is what was the difference between them and those who did want to intervene? And I do think at the end of the day, ideology and political belief was a big part of what separated those two kinds of people. We had one more. Uh, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Last question. Uh, yes, my name is Roger Cotretti, and it seemed, it's always seemed to me that the elephant in the room in this discussion has been fiscal policy, and you've touched on it several times, but sort of implicitly. One of the things I'd hope you could drill down on a little bit more is how much during this entire period has fiscal policy, either from the conservative point of view of small government or a liberal point of view of we have better things we could do with our money, uh, played into the debates? Because it seems to be it's, it's in the background, but it's, it's a powerful motivation for almost, and, and it's related to, but really quite distinct from the more romantic or poetic ideas of what's your view of the world relationships or stuff like that. So fiscal policy, where does it fit in this? Sure, but I mean, you know, one's judgment about fiscal policy is going to be affected by what one's attitude toward the world is, right? Because if, you, if the world is completely safe, then even I don't think we need to spend any money on defense, <laughs> right? So, but since I don't think the world is completely safe and I think the world's inherently anarchic and I think that great powers are inherently aggressive and all those other things, therefore, you know, there's no escaping that there's going to be some cost. And then the only question is, what cost do you want to play? Which then gets into, similarly, what role do you want to play in the world? Do you want to stay home uh, and hope that everything works out up there or decide that whether it works out of there or not is not affecting to us? That is, that is one approach. And I would certainly say that people who are opposed to big government, I mean, to give you the example, let's get away from the period that we all know well and we've lived through, but if you go back to the 1890s, in those days, the Democratic Party was the isolationist party. Why was the Democratic Party the isolationist party? Because they were the party of small government. Why were they a party of small government? Because they were the party of white supremacists and they didn't want the federal government telling them they couldn't do whatever they wanted to do. So that made them the party of small government and the party of small foreign policy. Um, you know, and then when they change their mind, when the Democratic Party changes its mind, it becomes the party of big foreign policy, you know? So I really think it's very hard to just take, I, I understand your point and you're right, but I think it's hard to separate even the fiscal consideration from these other issues. Good, okay. Well, this uh, brings our hour to an end, and the good news is we have books to sign <laughs> right over there. Um, please join me in thanking Bob Kagan. Thanks a lot.